Good morning. Always, always scare myself. Gee. <laughs> Welcome to worship here at St. Mark's from Reese Hall. Um, we've still got the air conditioning out, but we got some work coming just to kind of cobble it together. Hopefully this week, hopefully for Mari Smith's wedding on, uh, on Friday, it would be good to have it. It's not the total fix. It's a little fix. So if we're back in the sanctuary next week, you'll know it was successful. And then we need to do a little fundraising for a couple new units because it's not going to last. So I just throw that out there, put it in your mind, start, start figuring out how we're going to do that. Um, this week on Wednesday is uh, Ruby Erickson's funeral. Ruby uh, passed away last week, week before, probably. Um, so that is here at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. So, what else? Anything else that should be announced? I've been on vacation, so I feel like I don't know what's going on. Um, but otherwise, we'll begin. We'll begin in the name of God, the one we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. With our opening hymn, number 800. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We are now going to sing the Kyrie, which is actually hymn 157 in the hymn part.
Holy Day of Gloria is hymn number 878. From you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall with a, with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword and Israel must go into exile away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophecy there, but never again prophecy at Bethel, for it is lacking the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos said to Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Word of God, word of life. So on January 13th, 2019, our grandchildren were baptized. They were four years old and six years old at the time. It took our daughter and her husband a little time to find a a faith community to kind of settle in there. And then when Amy got elected to church council, that's our daughter, she thought, well, I suppose I should get the kids baptized too. So they were four and six, a little older than a lot of us when we were baptized. Um, After the baptism, we had dinner and a celebration over at our home uh, after that church service. And their, the grandkids, their great-grandparents, my parents, gave them each a children's Bible. 
you know, with some pictures in there. We've all had them, right? You had them? Yeah. Um, after dinner, Elsa came up to me and said, she's the four-year-old, said, Nana, read me a story from the Bible. And she opened it up, and the story she opened it up to was the story of Abraham almost sacrificing his son Isaac, which, and Isaac happens to be your brother's name, and I said, oh, that's not a good story. Let's read something else. And then I think she opened it to, to either the story of Cain and Abel and Cain killing his brother. Oh, that's not a good story. Find something else. And then it was like Joseph and his brothers trying to kill him and then deciding to sell him into slavery instead. And I, I said, oh, let's see what else we can find. And by then she was ready to do something else. <laughs> so I heard later that evening when they were going to bed, my son-in-law, their father, Carlos, was um, going to read them a story. And he said, how about we read something out of your new Bible? And, and Elsa says, no, there's bad stories in there. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is going to be good, right? So I'm telling you this story because today's gospel reading from Mark is one of those bad stories that would be easier not to read or look at. The Bible does not shy away from violence from the ugliness and brokenness of the human condition. Um, the Bible lays it all out there. It's all in there, and a lot of it's kind of bad to read. It tells the stories of violence and betrayal and pain and human suffering. That stuff is real. We all know it. But in addition, the Bible offers us an alternative story. We call it the gospel, right? It's a story that runs counter to the destructive and evil stories of the world. It's God's story. But we have to take a look at the bad stories of life to find the gift of the gospel story. So, a reading from the sixth chapter of Mark, beginning at verse 14. And you could read along if you want. I'm going to comment as we go. King Herod heard of it. For Jesus' name had become known. So the, the first thing, this King Herod is the son of King Herod the Great, um, the one who is best known for, his, uh, for trying to kill Jesus when he was an infant by slaughtering all the boys under two years of age. There's another bad story, if I may say. Um, king Herod, this is, his, this is the son of the first King Herod. King Herod heard of it. What's the it that King Herod had heard about? Well, just prior to this passage, Jesus is sending his disciples out uh, to do his work, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to announce the presence, the coming, the, the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Could that be like a rival kingdom to the kingdom of Herod? So, so King Herod gets wind of this. Um, King Herod heard of it. Jesus' name had become known. Um, and some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in Jesus. But others said it is Elijah, and others said it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. And then the rest of today's passage is a flashback explaining what happened to John the Baptist and why Herod was feeling so guilty about what he had done to John that when he heard about Jesus, he figured it was John back from the dead to get him. Okay. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. And John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Philip's still around. It's not like he died and his wife is a widow. He's still around. I'm not sure Herodias can actually be considered the wife of Herod. It's not quite a legal arrangement at this time. So that's going on. And John has been telling Herod and Herodias that uh, they're doing something wrong. And Herodias, the wife of Philip, kind of the wife of Herod, had a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she could not 
because Herod feared John. Actually, the word could also be translated, Herod respected John. Um, it's that kind of how we fear and love God. We respect, we honor. So Herod respected John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and Herod protected John. When he heard him, Herod was greatly perplexed, yet he liked to listen to him. He liked hearing the message that John was proclaiming. But here's where the story gets interesting. An opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias, it, it may well be that it's actually the daughter of Herodias, that's a little translation uh, glitch there, makes more sense to say the daughter of Herodias, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half my kingdom. Sounds like not a very good promise to make, doesn't it? You can just see this is going to end poorly. Well, she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? And her mother replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath, oaths and for his guests, he didn't want to refuse her. Hmm. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, when John's disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And then I'm supposed to say, the gospel of the Lord. Really? How is this good news? It's a pretty bad story, right? So we have this, this lectionary. We have assigned readings every Sunday. Uh, we are in a bunch of different denominations do the same thing. So I don't generally pick and choose, which is probably good because I don't think I'd ever pick this text to preach on. Um, and I maybe wouldn't preach about pick the text of Abraham almost sacrificing his son Isaac, for that matter, or Joseph's brothers selling him into slavery. The, that one actually ends up well. You just It takes years and years and years of heartache for Joseph before it does. So, so we have these readings assigned, and we follow these from week after week. And, but there's a problem with only getting a little chunk of the Bible in, in the assigned readings. The problem is that you miss the context. The story about the beheading of John the Baptist isn't a story that's meant to stand on its own. Mark, the, the writer of the Gospel, Mark, places it here in this Gospel for a reason. So we need to look a little at the passages before and after on either side of it to understand what's going on. What the point of this oh-so-bad story is. First, what comes before it? Right before it, Jesus and his disciples are preaching and healing all around Galilee, announcing what life is like in the kingdom of God under the reign of God. They're becoming known, their message is spreading, which causes them to be brought to Herod's attention. And then we have this whole story about a banquet in the halls of the palace of the king. A banquet put on by a corrupt and arrogant and immoral monarch a monarch who makes a stupid promise because he's attracted to his stepdaughter or daughter, which are both equally bad, and then he can't take back his promise because he doesn't want to lose face. A banquet in the halls of earthly power that leads to a deep, dark tragedy. John the Baptist, the one who spent his life and ministry pointing to Jesus, announcing the kingdom of God, is killed beheaded. A really, really bad story. And frankly, there's not a lot to preach on in that part of the story. Unless you look not only at what prompted the story, but also what comes next. 
Mark has brilliantly juxtaposed this gruesome, disturbing story of a banquet in Herod's kingdom with a story about a banquet in the kingdom of God. We move from palace halls to a deserted place where a great crowd has followed Jesus, a crowd of 5,000 plus people maybe, a hungry crowd that Jesus and his disciples provide a banquet for. But that's next week's story. We'll look at that a little more deeply next week. If you want to look ahead and read ahead, just go to Mark 6, uh, 30 to 44. As you read those, compare the banquet that Jesus provides to the banquet that Herod provides. I really think that one story needs the other. So tune in again next week for the rest of the story. But for today, what can we learn? There are two things I want to lift up today. You may be able to kill the messenger, but the message goes on. That's the first thing. John and Jesus, both proclaiming the same message, the inbreaking of the reign of God, a new way to live, a challenge to the powers that be, and they're both killed by those powers. We see that continuing today when people speak of an alternative way to be together, who stand up to the powers that be and are destroyed by those powers. But the message is indestructible. You can kill the messenger, but you can't destroy the message. God has a different way, a different intent for humanity and the creation, a different story, a different way of ruling that looks nothing like the ways of the world. And the second thing, think about the ways of the world. There's a lot in Herod's story that sounds familiar to me, that sounds like how things work in the world, and how we humans, with our arrogance and greed, our folly and our weakness, often create more harm than good, often try to destroy those messages and people that challenge us, that threaten our comfortable way of life. I think we all have a little Herod in us, a desire to impress, an attraction to the trappings of power and influence, a pride that gets us into trouble, an ego that can't step back even when it would be in everyone's best interest if we did so. The good news, the gospel, the indestructible message of the kingdom of God is that with all of our brokenness, all of our sinful and selfish nature, with all of our shortcomings and our half-hearted attempts to be good disciples, in spite of our failures, Jesus again and again invites us, welcomes us to the banquet of heaven in spite of ourselves. Because that's just how Jesus is. And that's just how life is under the reign of God. We are loved, we belong, and we have a place. We have a place here, around this table, where week after week, Jesus meets us in bread and wine, offering us his very self and the life and renewal that comes with that gift, a foretaste of the feast to come, a foretaste of the banquet of the kingdom of God. Today, it's kind of a special day around this table of grace. Today, Christian Tolly, who's sitting up here in the front, all excited. You, I'm sorry, I shouldn't draw attention. That's not. Anyway, Christian has been waiting for his first communion for a long, long time. He had his, his, his instruction way back before the pandemic, and then we shut down, and he's like, I want to have my first communion when we can all be together. Today is the day for Christian. Today, Christian takes his place with the rest of us at the table. Christian, there's always been a place for you at this table. And today you claim it. Today you take it. Welcome to the, the feast of the kingdom of God. Welcome to the table of grace, where everyone has a place, where there is always plenty, and there is always room for more. Thanks be to God. Amen. Cheers.
Let us say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Mother God, we, play, we pray for the Christian church throughout the world, for all who live holy and dedicated lives. We give thanks for the life and witness of John the Baptist. We pray for all who have been imprisoned for their faith, for all who at this time are facing persecution or danger, for all who stand firmly for freedom and justice. Give them strength and hope to carry on as they pursue peace in this troubled world. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we pray for St. Mark's, for our leaders who continue to provide spiritual guidance and many other forms of help to us. We pray especially for everyone who organizes, leads, or assists in church activities and for wise decisions as we come out of lockdown and so making the gospel accessible to all in our community. We pray also for Pastor David, Anna, Desmond, and Julian Bjorklund as they make the move to join us here at St. Mark's. Let us welcome them with open arms and thankful hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, we pray for all those who long to be free for those who seek asylum and refuge from their past, for the increasing number of people trafficked human lives throughout, bought and sold, for those whose health is failing and so taking away a freedom they used to know, for those working long hours with little or no pay, for those caught up in a cycle of unemployment, poverty, and hunger. You are the God who lives freely, whose love is unconditional and infinite. Lord, in your mercy. Sovereign Lord, we pray for all in authority in this country, making important decisions on our behalf, especially as we come out of lockdown and freedom beckons. May we serve us with wisdom and integrity for the good of all. Many people are busy rebuilding working lives and venturing out socially. <laughs> we ask your help to keep all of us safe and to remember there are those whose immune systems are compromised. We ask for your help to guide people to behave sensibly and protect the vulnerable and not to act self selfishly. We ask for your help and guidance to world leaders so that vaccines and medical help may reach everyone. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Cahesa Lutheran Church in Oringa, Tanzania, as we are not quite sure about the health issues there. We also pray for our reach home, the orphanage in Bapatla, India. Keep them safe in mind and body. May your ways of justice and peace protect all of us. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we pray for those in any kind of need in body, mind, or spirit. Surround with love all who are having difficulties in their relationships, those feeling betrayed or neglected, for marriage breakdowns, for children in broken homes, or homes with hatred and violence. We pray for those in daily pain, overwhelmed with the struggle of coping, for those who have been given a diagnosis that feels like a life sentence. We feel for all, we think of all of those that we have been asked to pray for, and we name them before you now in our hearts. Feel them with your healing and surround them with, all your, with your everlasting arms. 
With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place for all we we pray <laughs> we pray for all whom we pray for in in your eternal care. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. to the table of grace where Jesus himself meets us in bread and wine and we remember how in the night in which he was betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body given for you do this and remember me he also took the cup gave thanks gave it for all to drink said This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this and remember me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take and eat, take and drink. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given and shed for you, for me, for the world. Amen.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in God's grace. Amen. Our sending song is number 645. dear siblings in Christ. By your hands may love be shared. By your voice may peace be spoken. By your eyes may beauty be seen. By your ears may truth be heard. And by your life may the song of Christ be sung. Amen. Go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.